Hello everyone and welcome to the next Fireside Chat. Uh, the title of this session is Exploring Customer Centricity, Balancing Human Intuition and Technology. Um, quite a balancing act, isn't it? Yeah, quite a balancing act. Um, to tell us everything that we need to know about that in about 20 minutes is uh, Saira Khan, Head of Innovation and Partnerships at HSBC. Uh, please welcome to the stage. Now, one second. I'm going to have to tell you what I do with that title, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are actually, yeah. So Head of Innovation and Partnerships, that's quite a broad kind of remit, isn't it? Why don't you tell us a little bit more specific about what you do? Okay, um, let me take you a little bit back actually, yeah. uh, before I even do that. So um, my career as a whole has spanned over three facets. So it's been customer driven, front office, uh, for many, many years, that was kind of in the private banking space and wealth management. And then I moved over to transforming like wealth management and stuff like that. So transformation for a while. And then I led into what was digital adoption. You remember that big craze about how we drive everyone onto digital channels. And I did that for a facet of time and then came back from COVID. I was in Asia um, and spent a good chunk of time out in Kuala Lumpur, which we'll talk about later on. Um, and then when I came back, I joined First Direct Bank. And First Direct being one of the challenger banks for the, what, the last 31 years um, or more. And there was a great need for how do we look at leveraging partnerships and working with them at the time and kind of looking at new innovative ways of working with that. So my role's kind of been an encompassment of everything, all of that, you know, which I've explained and putting it into this role. But yeah, it's a fun title. I get to speak to a lot of fun people. I also get to be right in the middle of where all the change is happening. Um, and what a fun three years it's been, right? <laughs> Has it? Oh, gosh. Okay. <laughs> well, it joined in 2020, right? Um, I think what was it? I was saying to a colleague just before I jumped on here, and I was saying, I think we've all lived such a crazy time in the last three years. Um, yeah. If you go back to any economics books or business books or anything like that, you hear about catalysts. Um, and when we talk about catalysts, we think about, all right, there's going to be a war or something moving in the market that's going to kind of throw us off. Well, we've pretty much had everything, haven't we? We've had um, climate change. We've had a war as a catalyst, well, maybe two even. Um, we've had, you know, digital adoption. We've had the introduction of AI. Um, and when I look at all of that, I'm like, gosh, all of that has happened. But in the midst of all of that, we've had to make sure that our customers are being served correctly. And it's a good thing that we're talking about this today because I think we never saw, I think when I said yes to this earlier in the year, we didn't, we didn't really anticipate how quickly AI was going to take off. So it's going to be a very different chat to, to when, we, when we probably spoke earlier this year. Absolutely. I mean, it's one of the few um, titles or topics that doesn't seem to have AI in the title, but no conversation misses out AI right now. You, you talked there about customers. So how, how can companies ensure that they truly get into the mindset and truly think like their customers and prioritise their needs in a rapidly evolving world? Gosh, that's a mouthful. I love that one. Um, I think it's, it all boils down to that word culture. Um, and when we talk about cultural change, I think there's... For any organisation, whether it's small or whether it be large, I think we're all trying to drive customer experience to be the best. Um, if you look at any industry, any kind of area of like um, product or service, the customers are the ones that we serve. And I often think that we forget that sometimes along the way when technology gets um, kind of taken over, especially when we were looking at digital adoption previously. We kind of got way into the tech and the tools and then we forgot about the customer and then the customer started to say, well, actually, this is what I need. This time around, we're actually looking at the customer and we're going, what do you actually want? Do you want us to kind of contact you enough? Do you not want us to contact you enough? Um, and stuff like this. I think we're also learning now um, a lot, Scott. I think um, previously you could apply what you had in your handbooks. We're now writing a lot of the handbooks and the educational material because of what kind of change that we're living in. Um, but back to that, I think that, that cultural change is a huge facet of that. I think the other hat that I wear... Um, and that's one that I did in, in Asia, which was how do we drive cultural change and a mindset shift? 
And believe it or not, I think that's the hardest thing to do for our colleagues, um, which is internal staff members, and also to kind of keep up with the external market as well. So you've got two kind of you know, pendulums here. You've got one which is the change happening outside of the market and the customers moving at their own speed. And then you've got the mindset shift that you need to you know, deal with on the internal basis. So I think that the, the shift that really needs to take place is that internal focus as well as external um, on your employees and your businesses. How do you get those two pendulums to synchronise? You need to make it a priority. I think that's the thing. I think a lot of people don't make it a priority. But if you look at most organisations that have done it very, very well, and look outside of the industry as well, and this is one of the things I think that I do a lot, and um, there are a couple of my colleagues that I see do very, very well, actually, is don't just look at your industry. Look outside of the industry and look at the other brands and how they've done it very well. Um, and I think that the way that you can do that is, um, and I don't want to name names because there are lots of great companies out there that you're all kind of, you know, active users of, but you see how quick they are to kind of drive that. Um, employees um, as a lifeblood, you know, just giving back to them as well um, and the retention tool for those as well. I want to go back to the technology side of things um, we started talking about. What are the advantages and the limitations of relying on that technology too much? Because we, we seem to be increasingly doing so. You mentioned chat GPT and obviously yeah. uh, generative AI. But um, when it comes to understanding humans and you know, the customer, what they want and their preferences, is there a danger that we rely too much on the technology to tell us what the human wants? I think we are doing that now. I think there was... It's very interesting, actually. I think market by market, it was very different before. Um, if you looked across, and this is a personal kind of a, an observation of mine, if you looked across Asia, I called it the FOMO kind of, um, the FOMO fact. What happened was you had people, if there was change that was to be adopted or change that was being drive, everybody's trying to grasp that very, very quickly. And as you got to our side of the market, which was in the West, there was a little bit of, um, how safe is this? How secure is this? And maybe I don't want to use this right now. And it was almost kind of a, let me make you comfortable with this, that this is safe and secure before we use it. Um, and I think that often, the, the safer that a customer feels with a tool, the more likely they are to use it. Um, in our market in particular, especially in the UK, in Europe, I think that we, we do face a lot of interesting customer challenges where they challenge us back. Um, in, you know, how secure is this, how safe is this? They're very active in giving feedback, which is exactly what we need. Um, but then we also have the other side of the coin, which is spending a lot of time with them to get them up to speed with, you know, the kind of change that we're trying to drive. We don't have enough time with AI, though, and that's the challenge that I've seen. I think AI is, what is it, I explained it in another talk, it was like a car that's taken off um, and we have yet to, you know, understand where the brakes are, the gears, you know, we're kind of fixing it as we go along, but it's not going to stop. And hence the reason why this year you've seen, you know, governments, industry experts come together. And actually, it's a real privilege for the UK to be right in the middle of all of that, to drive these conversations. But I think at the same time, that's also a heavy, heavy warning to all of us to say, just make sure that you're also keeping up to speed with the customers and their expectations and keeping them informed. Um, and customers just want to feel that the trust element is there, the safety is there, and that they're feeling like, you know, you understand the tool that's being given out. And that's where regulation comes in. And there's a lot in there, but... Yeah. Um, well, let's talk about the, the regulation there. I mean, what do you think needs to needs to happen let's talk well continue talking about ai and regulation i suppose you said it's this car that's not stopping but no one knows how to drive it so what what regulation do we need to make sure that car doesn't crash i'll leave that to the experts in bletchley park earlier this year i think we've we've kind of got to a point where we know that that ai is going to be uh, i mean look i think the panel before said it very well we all know that it's been around for a very long time we've all been users of it whether it be through our phones in siri alexa and lots of other tools AI is not new. I think what's new is the, the, the version of the ChatGBT that we've seen that have come out, and they've just rapidly been a huge scaling kind of a, a kind of a, a program. And everyone's gone, oh, wow, this is amazing. But you're like, well, it's been around for a while. The difference is that we've just let it out to the public, and it's just been a lot quicker now. 
Now, what that is going to do, where my mind, and this is my personal kind of views on this, is that it's shifting our views on the speed at which we were used to. On, you know, this, we had time to sit back and, and figure out things. What AI has done is made us all kind of sit up and go, oh gosh, you need to move a little bit more faster than you used to. And that's had a knock-on impact on regulators, risk, legal, and all those types of things. Now, I don't think that there's harm in us slowing it down, but the question is, can we slow it down? Um, and that's where, that's where we, we don't know. But what we do know is that it's definitely got huge amounts of opportunity. It's got huge amounts of leverage. It is going to make society better if it's used properly. Um, but also, it's going to put a huge interesting strain on customer experience as well. It's also difficult when you're an organisation like HSBC, obviously, all around the world, because... Um, Am know, I in brand colours today? Uh, you're absolutely on brand I am first direct, I, I, but I, I did, did go notice, on brand yeah, colours. I did put a bit of black in here too. Is the phone case <laughs> even on brand? It is, it is, wow. it is. I went white, white and black, guys, for the old... Don't make well. <laughs> um, I completely forgot what I was going to say now. Regulation, Sorry. that's what I was talking about. Um, obviously, huge global... Um, financial institution, HSBC, um, with yeah. uh, branches, offices all over the world. Regulation is not a level playing field. So how does an organisation like HSBC tackle that? Because it's all very well talking about the UK market, for instance, but like you say, the, the regulations in Malaysia or elsewhere might be completely different. So how do you tackle that as a business? No, you know what? You're, that's a hard one to tackle by myself. And I probably need some regulators up here with me. Um, but I'll give you just a personal view. We were just we were fighting that with open banking, weren't we not? We've been talking about it with open banking for such a long time. And, and if we just touch on open banking, it had to be forced in the UK from a VRP perspective for us to kind of really grasp it. Um, but the other markets hadn't caught on as quickly as we had. Um, I think there is going to be a challenge on, on the regulation side. But I think the difference here is, Scott, is that we've got together globally um, in very different circumstances that we haven't seen before. So if you look, again, going back to that Bletchley Park AI summit that we saw from, from Rishi Sunak, um, that's huge. That's sending a huge signal. That's getting the right people in the room. That's getting the leaders in the room and saying, let's talk about this. I think there's a huge other element to it, and this is, again, it's outside of banking, but a personal view. You have to think about the ethical issues on it on a personal level. So, but from a HSBC perspective and a First Direct perspective, if I'm speaking from us, I think we've got the right you know, kind of interest in the area. We've got the right regulators around the table talking about it. And we've got everybody focusing in on the right kind of, you know, um, kind of areas that we need to. And fortunately, being such a huge organisation that's got an international footprint, you tend to see things happening across the world. And I think that's what makes it really, really interesting. Um, so I think we're, we're positioned quite well, um, and, but that's just by design and global footprint. Um, maybe we can help others as well, right? <laughs> of course. Um, now, in your, in your role as head of innovation, or part of your role, give us some examples maybe about how um, HSBC has prioritised innovation in the industry and what initiatives you've undertaken. I'm so proud of the innovation banking stuff that we did with SVB earlier this year. I think one of the, the, the proudest moments for us was when you know we took a little bit of an economic tumble um, that HSBC came in very, very timely over a weekend and kind of got involved in the SVB kind of restructure stuff. And, and that for me was a huge turning point um, to be proud of in 2023. I think that not only did it show that, you know, we were able to act on a timely kind of a matter, we also kind of came in and we, we serviced the right kind of industry as well. I mean, the, the, the fintech industry and the, the founders have gone through some real kind of challenging times over the last few years. Um, and to come in and do that, and I think that that kind of salvaged a lot of the interesting ideas that we've got that are going to be really relevant for our future. So I think that's, that's been a massive one for me. The other thing is um, we've also got the um, uh, applied innovation, uh, AI kind of a, a department that we started up and one of my colleagues is you know, really driving that internally. One of the focuses that I see that he's doing is that he's driving out a real culture shift and a mindset shift within the organization, which is where I think that you really need to drive it so everyone understands it before we understand what's going on outside. Um, 
So I think that's, an, that's a two that kind of kick out for me. Okay, and now you've made it sound quite simple, but obviously innovation is a challenge, right? Oh my God, it's it, like pushing water up a hill. <laughs> <laughs> well, apart from trying to push water up a hill, what are the biggest challenges, I suppose, that you've faced with innovation in recent <gasps> times? And how did, you, how did you address those or how did you overcome those challenges? Such a good question. A lot of people sitting here probably are in, doing innovation to a certain degree and probably thinking the same, going, gosh. Um, you have to wake up with a special kind of resilience every single morning, I'm not going to lie. Um, doing a role that has, forget the title for a second, but even if you were just doing an innovation role or a transformation role, um, you know, I think they use, these terms are used a lot, or doing a change role, I think when you're driving change, it's going to be hard. And I think that in order to do that, I think you need to have a certain level of tenacity, resilience, um, kind of real go-getting attitude. Um, and that served me well. The other thing is, the biggest thing that I think people are not, and I think that you need to home in on, not only with yourselves, but also with individuals around you, is let's not forget with AI taking off, the people skills are gonna become very, very relevant. And I think that's what served me really well in the innovation space. When you're trying to get your ideas out, or you're trying to also focus on your ideas within an organisation, there is a lot of negotiation. It goes back to the old skills from sales, from like you know my wealth management banking days, um, is how do you sell an idea? How do you get people comfortable with it? How do you get them comfortable with the risk that they're about to take on as well? Um, there has been some secret sources that I've driven along the way, and I think that I'll give you some of those. But I think for me, what's worked really well is it's really hard to get your idea across, and I think. Often people spend too much time on the pitch decks and their pitches and all of that stuff. Get a demo out there, show somebody what your demo does and stop selling it too much. And I think that's where you've got to understand the audience that you're working with. Um, so what I've often done is just got, you know, rapidly tested ideas, got some demos out there and said, this is what it looks like, rather than here's a deck explaining all of the different kind of, and I think the decks have got a little bit older now, uh, but that's a personal view. I'm sure many of you probably love using decks. <laughs> You've said personal view quite a few times here yeah. today. Um, okay, just some final thoughts then, I suppose, when it comes to you know, driving innovation um, in, in the banking sector. Give us some examples that you're particularly proud of of what you've worked on over the last three years or key partnerships that have helped to deliver oh, those? God, uh, definitely the data-driven ones. I've worked with a phenomenal company um, who has... Ha and and I, the reason why is this key partnership for us was around the data and how to personalize transaction enrichments. And you can see that through um, some, of the, some of the app. Although it's a simple feature now, and it's a, a BAU for many of us, um, it was hugely telling on the internal team. So it was very, it was, I was very proud of working with them in teaching our teams. And I say that very like uh, loosely because what I saw was when a partnership and a big organization worked together, there's a huge opportunity and it's beautiful to watch how the two teams come together. And I think that there's learnings not only from the smaller companies, but also from the larger companies as well on both sides. And for me, there's a, you know, there's a huge deck that I've got on this, but also lots and lots of things that I can discuss. That's a whole new topic. Um, but I think working with partnerships has been a key learning curve, but also to see the shift in the teams. The second one for me has been driving the cultural change around innovation and digital adoption. We only stopped talking about digital adoption because COVID helped us. Let's not forget that. COVID forced digital adoption on all of us. And, you know, I've got my grandma and my mum using it and, and telling me how to use Instagram and TikTok. I'm like, thanks, mum. Um, I wouldn't have dreamed of that a few years ago um, where we were trying to think about how to drive it. So I think sometimes circumstances help you with the adoption of tools as well. But what you can't do, and, and I think there's a gap here, is that cultural change and mindset shift. I think you still need to keep driving yourself back to that. So what I do, I still wear another hat um, all the time, which is around driving. How do you drive cultural change for AI now? How do you drive a cultural change for customer experience? Um, how do I get people you know, recognized for being a part of this change as well? And I think we all know that if you're dri driving towards a purpose, you're more likely to be involved if you feel involved as well. And I think that those things all need to be, you know, married up and come together. I think I'm most proud of also the, um, the work that I did out in, 
in Kuala Lumpur um, is teaching them a lot of the, the tools that we had from here um, out and, you know, kind of teaching the teams out there and, and watching them adopt those, but making them their own. And I learned a hell of a lot around how I need to be culturally nimble as well, that not every tool works exactly as it is. We need to make some changes to it. Um, so your blueprint changes all the time. So a degree of um, agility and adoption to local um, cultures as well is essential. Absolutely. And I, I think that one thing that we should not stop doing is not stop asking what does it the customer want and are we still serving the customers? And I think in everything you do, it might sound so simple, but we often forget that when we're driving a product and service, when we're building it actually. We start going, what is the tech going to do? And where's the engineering going to go? And where's the piping going to go? And you're like, but hold on, what does a customer want? what's personalised, relevant information at the right time for them. And I think that if you're serving me as a customer, you need to tell me when, you know, delicately, you know, at the right time, be, be involved in those conversations. I mean, look, I'm wearing a watch at the moment. It's going to be used for many, many personalised kind, of, um, kind of informational tools. I think that's we're going to serve a place there. So the customer... Is, customer the most, is, is the biggest focus. Oh, of course. I think we're yeah. all here because we're all serving some kind of customer in some facet, right? Yeah. Otherwise, why would you be doing what you're doing? Okay, good point to leave it on. Uh, thank you, Syrah Khan. Yay, thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. it. We've got another thank one you. after me now. Sorry? We've got another one after me.